Okay, we live? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, okay, good evening, everyone. And uh, I'd like to start by welcoming everybody to Badminton Ireland's first uh, Return to Sport webinar. Um, I'm just going to start by introducing everybody, uh, starting with myself. So my name is David McGill. I'm the Chief Executive Officer. Uh, also on today's webinar, we've got Fiat Andrews, who's our Membership and Development Manager. Uh, we've got Connor Fadden, who's our Governance Officer. And Carla Kennedy is going to be managing the uh, chat today. So any questions you have, Carla is going to be uh, the gatekeeper for those. And uh, Sarah O'Donoghue, who you can't see, is uh, monitoring the YouTube. Um, so the guys have some presentations uh, which will hopefully answer any questions that people have submitted. But I'm just going to give everyone a bit of a background into how we've gotten to this point. Um, obviously, everything has been shut down since mid-March. And... Uh, We've been working behind the scenes with Sport Ireland and the government to come up with a set of protocols that would allow for the, the safe return of badminton. Um, of course, many people would probably know we issued uh, our first draft uh, last week um, or about, maybe about two weeks ago um, with the intent of running this webinar last Friday. Of course, that was uh, quickly changed by the government's welcome announcement that they were going to accelerate things somewhat in sport. Uh, of course, that left us scrambling and then we had to unfortunately delay our webinar to this evening. But uh, I think yeah, the benefits from the acceleration uh, will, be, uh, will be really good for clubs. Um, and we'll go through the, uh, the implications of those in a minute. Um, we did put out a call for questions um, and they've been open for about two weeks. And we've gathered all those questions. We've analyzed them and uh, the guys have pr prepared two presentations which should broadly answer most of those questions. I'll, uh, I'll have some words at the end to explain what Babington Ireland is doing for clubs and members and what the, uh, what the horizon looks like, I suppose, uh, moving past phase three. Uh, and then we'll hopefully have some time at the end for people to submit questions that Carla will, uh, will pass on to ourselves and we'll try and answer those as, as uh, as, as best we can. Um, of course, I will, you know, I will remind everyone that this is a fairly um, fluid situation. And as we saw last week, things can change quite quickly for both the positive and negative. So um, I do, I do, I would advise people to constantly check the COVID section on our website. We'll, all, we'll be issuing updates as and when we get them that may affect how you run the club. So I think that's a key piece of information for people to take away today. Um, but yeah, so that's all for me for the moment. And without further ado, I'm going to pass you on to Fake Andrews. Uh, thank you, David. Um, so tonight, guys, uh, I'm going to kick off the presentation by giving an overview of the product, protocols that have been circulated um, and that have been published on our website. Um, and those are protocols around uh, club activities, coaching activities, and also playing activities. Uh, but just to give a refresher in terms of what's involved in this phase, so it is stated in our protocols that sporting activities may recommence in phase three, provided that the issued protocols are adhered to by all clubs, players, officials, volunteers, and all relevant personnel involved in our sport. Moreover, physical distancing of two meters must be enforced, and it is the responsibility of all of us involved in, in badminton to ensure that that's actioned. Uh, likewise, with all people returning on Monday the 29th, uh, we want to ensure that we as a sport uh, adhere to the guidelines in order so we can create a safe environment um, and to limit the social interactions, which is also uh, stated in, in terms of the, the government uh, protocols. Uh, so with that, I'm going to start a screen share. Um, and as David said, we had a number of questions in. So I'm going to begin by looking at uh, the club protocols. Uh, so if you just bear with me there a second. So in terms of uh, club actions or key considerations uh, for phase three beginning on Monday, June 29th, um, and which is to run up until July 20th at present. Uh, some of the key considerations for clubs uh, to keep in mind uh, the first one is to appoint a COVID officer and there would be communication around this and a form up online uh, for clubs to nominate their COVID officer so Babington Ireland are aware of who's uh, taking on that task and that can be someone who's already on the club committee. Uh, 
Uh, the second one would be to complete the BI risk, risk assessment document uh, that's circulated and also up on the website. Uh, the third one, and one we've done a, a good bit of research around venues recently, but is for clubs to contact their, their venue and see if they're open uh, in terms of returning to action. So um, obviously clubs play in a number of different facilities, whether it be school halls, community halls, church halls. Uh, it, there's a wide span there. So uh, just to contact the venue before anything uh, begins again. The fourth one is to ensure compliance with protocols before reopening. And um, so, uh, as it says there, just to tick all the boxes in, in terms of all the tasks required um, gather contact information for all members. And, and this is especially important um, should contract contact tracing become necessary. So to have an update, updated database of all contact details uh, for members within your club. And um, the next one then is in terms of club night scheduling. So scheduling should be done in advance of anyone attending the venue for club play um, and should be circulated to anyone who uh, has looked to arrange a slot on club nights um, and circulated to those members three hours in advance uh, of the session. And also in terms of record keeping um, by the club, and again, going back to that point on contact tracing, it's important that clubs maintain records of everyone uh, who plays on, on all club nights. Um, in terms of cleaning and sanitization, from a cleaning point of view, uh, it's important to identify protocols around touch areas. So um, if someone touched the post, for example, uh, cleaning and wiping down of those, um, and then also sanit sanitizing in terms of, of the product products within the club. Uh, first aid isolation room is um, to be, I suppose, to be earmarked in case anyone does present uh, on a club night with feelings of being unwell. Um, and they would be taken to that isolation room and assessed. Uh, the maximum number of people allowed in the venue during phase three is 50 people. And that's 50 people, including players, coaches, um, and uh, officials, or in, in the case of juvenile clubs, any parents who may be present. Um, and that's 50 people also uh, maintaining that physical distancing of two meters. Uh, for juvenile clubs, uh, juvenile players can have one parent um, per juvenile member. And again, just to touch on, on the point of it is the responsibility of, of everyone involved um, to enforce the guidelines. Um, but particularly for clubs, it's important to enforce the guidelines with members. So uh, that appropriate instruction before anyone turns up to club activities. Um, and then also when, when people are uh, at the venue itself, uh, that they're adhering to the guidelines uh, and those are being enforced. Uh, just a final point, actually, uh, and one of the questions that came in was around non-members and if they could attend badminton activities. And what we would say on that is uh, the, same, the same rules apply here as they would in a regular season. So non-members um, do have a trial period with the Badminton Ireland Insurance Waiver form um, of up to three sessions, um, and they are covered to attend for that. If, if uh, they were to go past that, then all liability would fall on the club in terms of those personnel be being present at activities. And so it's just important to bear that in mind. I'm going to jump on now to key considerations around the coaching protocol document um, that, that's out there. Um, so the first one, again, is to develop and prepare a risk assessment. So our coaching and governance team uh, in, together have been working on that, um, and there'll be more information on that in the coming days. Um, the second one is to request a permission to coach from the club or the venue uh, where, where, that, where the activity is going to be taking place. To liaise with the club venue on cleaning and set up protocols. Um, so for coaches, just to be really, really clear in advance of attending any facility, uh, what the cleaning and set up protocols and who's responsible for those. Uh, all payments should be made online um, with, uh, with no cash handling during this phase. Uh, again, to maintain attendance records, important for all coaches. Um, and then in terms of coach player ratios, so the coach player ratios, um, as per supervision guidelines, are that 
a maximum of one coach for every eight juveniles under the age of 12. Um, and that, that number increases to one coach for every 10 uh, over the age of 12. Um, now, what's important, obviously, uh, to touch on there is that uh, no coach be working in a juvenile setting alone uh, and that there be a second coach or a supervisory uh, person present also during those activities. Um, to enforce physical distancing, once again, is of the utmost importance. Um, and in terms of before this session, to distribute instructions um, to anyone who's going to be attending. Um, so players are very clear when they do uh, attend activities, uh, what, what the guidelines look like for them. Um, and then finally is, is to limit coaching equipment. So um, any unnecessary equipment in, in terms of um, that, might be, that might be handled by anyone. Uh, it's just to limit that equipment um, to reduce the risk during this phase. I'm just going to jump on again and look at some of the playing considerations. Uh, so some of the con key considerations for players uh, before attending activities. Uh, and the first one is to check, check in with your GP um, if you're in a high risk category uh, to deem if, if it's suitable to go back to attending badminton activities during phase three. Uh, the second one is to provide contact details to the club. Um, and again, that goes back to the contact tracing point we made under club considerations. To stay at home if uh, you're in one of the following, a high risk health category, um, and you haven't received uh, the go ahead from uh, your GP uh, or medical personnel. Uh, if you're displaying COVID symptoms, if you've been abroad in the last 14 days, or if you've been in contact with someone who has had COVID in the last 14 days, you're asked to stay at home. Um, Pre-arranged court slot uh, with the club. So that's to ensure you know exactly when to arrive uh, and when to depart from the venue. And that must be arranged in advance. And then in terms of travel, and this was another question uh, that was submitted to us uh, over the last two weeks. And that is that for phase three, you must travel alone to the venue. And so no pooling for anyone who, no car pooling, sorry, for anyone who will be attending uh, badminton activities in phase three. For players then, and considerations once they are at the venue, um, arrive and leave as close to playing times uh, as possible. Um, so players should not enter a facility until all those in the group before them, uh, in accordance with the schedules submitted by the club, um, should enter the facility uh, to enforce physical distancing. And um, so that, again, that, that's all our responsibilities. To play with consistent groups and partners. And um, so initially when we issued the first batch of protocols, um, doubles play was only uh, being allowed for people living in the same household. Uh, since, the, since the adjustments or uh, the, protocols, the guidelines from government have been sped up over the last week, uh, players can now rep return to double play, uh, doubles play. The advice um, and the, the enforced uh, guideline on this is that play must be with consistent partners for doubles. So one partner uh, if playing men's or women's doubles um, and then one other partner if playing mixed doubles. Uh, do not share equipment, uh, a shuttle per player, uh, or the use of gloves in terms of best practice around the shuttle. Uh, kit or equipment should be kept behind the court as opposed to along, along the side of the court. A mask should be worn in the venue um, if a player is waiting to go on court and, and is on a break from playing, um, provided the facility ha has the space to, to cater for those numbers. Uh, a gentle reminder uh, to others, should you see someone who isn't adhering to the guidelines? Um, and then the final one there is to contact the GP post-session if feeling unwell. Um, and then the club would be informed also after that. Um, so that's the, that's the main considerations around the coaching, uh, the playing, and also uh, the club side of things. So with that, I'm now going to pass you on to Connor. Uh, Fajan, and he is going to take you through the next part of the presentation. Thanks, thanks, Fig. 
Um, yeah, so just to bring you through a couple of items here that have brought been brought to us through the question form. In terms of the COVID-19 officer, uh, we've been asked, is it necessary? And in terms of being able to monitor club activity, it's, uh, it, it is a necessary position. There is no qualifications in terms of what the person has to have to take on the position. Um, in terms of say a health and safety qualification or anything like that, it's more so a case that the person who takes on the club COVID-19 officer role has the time to be able to, to take it on and also that they're available throughout the session. So um, in, in saying that, that a coach, for example, who's coaching a session cannot take on the club COVID-19 officer role for that particular session. It needs to be a separate person who's able to apply themselves fully to the role throughout that particular session. In terms of the role description we have, um, we have done up a job description for the Club COVID-19 officer, and that is available in the resources section of the website as well. And also we would ask clubs to register your COVID-19 officer uh, with Babington Ireland. So again, on the website, you're able to fill out a form there uh, to register your COVID-19 officer. And through that, then we'll be able to offer uh, further training, uh, hopefully next week when we complete a, a training for COVID-19 officers. And so it's important that you register your COVID-19 officer and we know who to get in contact uh, with throughout, throughout this phase. Yeah. So see if we can get on to the next slide there. Okay, oh, sorry there. Okay, so uh, just to run you uh, just to run you through um, this particular uh, this slide here, uh, it was just to show what a one court hall might look like in terms of how how to apply uh, within within the current guidelines. So you would have your entry into the hall, you'd have your your exit, and obviously what you're what you're hoping is that your people would be able to exit exit safely, maintaining physical distancing at all times, and obviously your coach then as well uh, being able to be present. In the case of juvenile players, obviously you may have a parent present, and it's important that we were able to, um, to, to provide that, that safety element around it. And again, it's just making sure that uh, once the, the top half of the court egress, that then the bottom half can egress, and then the next, the next session may enter the, enter the hall then. In terms of a three-court hall, um, again, obviously there'd be more people involved, um, potentially. And again, it's a case of um, entry into the hall and exit from, uh, and, and obviously the, the court nearest the exit will be the court that will exit first, um, followed by the second, followed by the first. And again, then you may have an, an influx thing coming in through the entry. Um, the coaches then might operate along the nets. So again, we're, we're maintaining physical distancing where possible. And um, so that's just a brief, a brief overview in terms of how it might work in both a one, co one court and a three court hall. So in terms of juveniles, uh, the same safeguarding principles apply in terms of people who are, who are supervising or coaching children that they'll have their safeguarding training, their guard of etting um, in place. And, and valid and up to date. And the vetting process has changed with Babington Ireland, obviously with Irish Sport HQ with the office being closed and people can now, um, they can process their guard of vetting with me and they are outlined in the safeguarding guidelines. So it involves now filling out the ID verification form, uh, attaching your proof of ID, proof of address, and then I'll verify your, your identification over, over the phone. Okay, so. And the process at the moment is actually, it's very quick. There's generally a 24 to 48 hour turnaround. So if your vet needs updating, we can still facilitate that. In terms of safeguarding training, uh, also that has had to change as well due to safeguarding training not currently being in operation. So in order to overcome this, Sport Ireland have recommended that we accept the e-learning TUSLA uh, module and the Sport Ireland online refresher course. So both courses must be completed uh, as an interim measure while the safeguarding workshops are not in operation. Uh, it is in the pipeline that safeguarding training will be delivered online, 
and as information comes out on that, we will provide that information to the clubs. I suppose a key concern in terms of supervision uh, with regards to juveniles is the entry and exit uh, from, from venues and from badminton halls. So it's just bearing in mind that um, obviously we want less people inside the hall where possible. So it's a case of just making sure that everything is safe, the children are safe and that their parents are collecting them and that there's no mingling outside in large groups um, uh, to take into consideration that it's, it's essentially arrive, play, exit and go home. It's, uh, it's, it's as simple as that. In terms of juveniles uh, coming to a session on the first hand on, on, for the first session, it's important that uh, there is a form of induction done with them just to advise them on, on the process and it should be really communicated with parents prior to the first session as well. Again, also very important that contact details are correct for parents and, uh, and basically that any of the guidelines that, that FIAC has gone through have been communicated uh, with, with the parents of juvenile players. In terms of practical actions, um, obviously FIAC has ran through some of these before, but I suppose just going into a bit more detail, it's in terms of the venue provider, it's making sure that there's adequate cleaning procedures in place, that, um, that, that it's, uh, it's agreed upon between yourself, between the club and the venue provider as to, as to how the cleaning procedures will be managed while the club is in operation. Um, the COVID-19 risk assessment, obviously it needs to be completed by the club and the COVID officer needs to be aware of the actions that are, are there, obviously, so there to sign off on the risk assessment. The disclaimer form, um, the disclaimer form is essentially a code of conduct while, while COVID-19 is in operation. It's, it's essentially to confirm that, they're, that participants are healthy and are aware of their responsibilities coming into play in the badminton hall and by return to play that they're aware that, they're, that they still comply with, with what they've signed up to and agreed to. In terms of the online response form for clubs, again, it's just making us aware of who the COVID-19 officer is and that we will be providing training. So we need to be able to contact the people who need that assistance and help um, throughout, throughout this, this phase in particular. Okay, and induction to players, again, it's, it's just making them aware of sanitizing stations on entry into the building that they sanitize, on exit that they sanitize, and then the, the playing guidelines that they're aware of what's expected from them. Okay, so in terms of GDPR, you will be required to, to maintain an, an attendance log. What we're asking you to do is to maintain a log basically of the name and the, um, the name and the mobile phone number, and just making sure that all contact details are correct. Okay, so in terms of confidentiality, the access and storage of these documents should be that it's, it's with the COVID-19 officer and, and if required that if, if a participant does fall ill with COVID-19 and the HSE need required to do contact tracing that the COVID-19 officer has access to that information to assist. Okay, um, I know David will discuss further, further on in terms of uh, potential potential uh, actions we have coming down the line in terms of GDPR. Uh, but at the moment, it's a case of just maintaining a log of name a mobile phone number and, and making sure that uh, details are kept accurately and kept correct. Okay, thanks guys. Um, I'm aware there's a number of questions coming in on the chat and on the YouTube and um, I've, I've answered a few of those as the guys were talking. And I've highlighted a few I'm going to talk about or we'll talk about in a minute, but I just want to talk, um, just update people on some other things, just more broadly stuff, uh, such as what's happening with the rest of the current season. Uh, obviously, uh, things came to a halt in mid-March and um, we had, did have to cancel some events, but we the events committee has met recently and a proposal is uh, has been drafted to try and run uh, the remainder of the season or, or some of the remainder of the season. Uh, at the start of next season. Now it's still under discussion and it may not all work out, but uh, we are hoping to run uh, the interleagues, the interpros, the graded finals. Those are all uh, on the uh, the planning list, shall we say. And we, we do hope to run them uh, before the end of this season, but uh, it does require uh, further discussion and planning on our part. 
Um, I do want to touch on the insurance considerations. I know Fake mentioned it, but I do think it's very, very important to stress this point. Um, it's now important more than ever that every member of a club is affiliated to BI. Uh, these protocols we've set out are for Badminton Ireland members for clubs. If there's someone in your club who's not a BI member, they don't have to follow those protocols. Uh, they're under no obligation to do so because they're not members of Badminton Ireland. If there's a dispute, if there's an issue relating to somebody who's not affiliated to Badminton Ireland, we cannot get involved. Uh, so for the, the safety of your club, um, for the safety of our volunteers, we are really encouraging you to make sure that anyone who's playing in your club is affiliated. Um, there is a waiver form, as Connor said, and for one or two sessions, that's absolutely fine. We, we'd still honour that. But beyond that, I do think it's very important for clubs to be aware of this um, uh, moving forward. On the supports for clubs, uh, Connor rightly mentioned uh, the GDPR element. We have been looking at this um, quite a lot uh, the past number of weeks. Our aim is to try and provide a contact tracing um, support for clubs that would allow them to, to manage their sessions a lot quicker and to do the contact tracing for them without a lot of administrative burden. Uh, we're still in the process of assessing a couple of providers um, and we hope to have something ready. However, given the acceleration of the, the uh, roadmap, we weren't expecting to be in this position so quickly, uh, which is a benefit for the sport, but obviously we have yet to, to finalize those discussions, um, but we would hope to have something by the start of the season. Another support I do want to touch on, and I think it's very important for clubs to be aware of, was the recent announcement by uh, the government for a restart grant. Now, obviously, a lot of that funding has been already been um, assigned to uh, other sports. However, there is still quite a bit of uh, resources there that we can access. And I'm encouraging all clubs to have a think about the financial impact of restarting and any, any basically anything you think might assist you in getting the club back up and running, especially if you're having uh, concerns as to whether you might be able to start back in September. Uh, we haven't seen any information yet on what these applications will look like. However, uh, FAIC and the development team are working on a set of resources for clubs. We'll probably run a couple of webinars around it, uh, issuing advice on how you can apply and how to fill out the application form. And we're really encouraging every club uh, to have a, a really uh, strong think about it, talk to your committee about it and, and start thinking about it early. Every sport and club in the country is going to go for this and badminton should be no different. In terms of what's happening next, um, and this will probably relate to a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, as of right now, the protocol set up relate to phase three. That's going to last for three weeks. We will be in contact with Sport Ireland um, throughout that time, assessing the, the, the protocols that are there now and looking to relax some of the restrictions. I know a couple of questions in there around shuttles, and I do understand that obviously um, it seems a little bit much in terms of having two shuttles per game. An alternative is to wear a plastic glove on your other hand. Obviously, I can see some people wouldn't be too pleased about that, but uh, this is, the, this is the, the standard we've been given. It's what tennis are doing as well. And it's, it's for this phase only. I, I, there's not a lot of research on um, contracting the virus through an object passing, but we're taking it slow. The last thing we want coming into this is for clusters to start appearing in badminton clubs. If clusters start appearing in badminton clubs, we will go straight back to where we were pre these restrictions lifting. And, and that, that will come from Sport Ireland telling us to, to close up shop. Uh, we have to be very careful and sports are taking it slow, but I would hope that we could move past that particular requirement by, say, phase four. Um, on that, we will be issuing communication in the lead up to phase four on anything that has changed. Uh, for example, uh, we've been dealing with uh, Gymnastics Ireland and working with the Federation of Ireland to get some more information on juvenile clubs. There is a lot of research out there that suggests that juveniles could theoretically play in what they're calling pods um, and therefore not require any social distancing. However, we haven't had any confirmation of that and we haven't had any approval of that. So we can't issue that directive. But again, if we get that approval from the sport expert group, uh, we will issue amendments to the current protocols or it will be amended um, for uh, phase four. Uh, some people have asked, when can we get back to play? When can we get back, sorry, not to play. When can we get back to um, 
running tournaments, running leagues or running our AGM. Again, based on the protocols, anything can be done as long as it's in line with those protocols. Uh, particularly stuff like AGMs, we've had to extend our own AGM and we've extended it now for August. Um, in August, we plan to run our AGM, but that's going to be in phase four. So maximum 100 people can attend and we will have to make sure that all of those people can maintain social distancing. So that might likely mean for us a larger venue. Uh, and that's considerations clubs will have to take into account as well when they're planning these things. The same for leagues, the same for tournaments. You can run them, but you have to comply with the, the, the legislation and the, the safety protocols we've issued. So tournaments, maximum 50 people in a, in a venue. As Fiek said, that includes your officers, your uh, anybody who's working in the venue. And I do understand that that can be quite restrictive however it is a fine sight better than what we were looking at in terms of the original phase three and unfortunately we can only wait for the government to slowly uh, release and, and allow more people to to be indoors at the moment it's 50 phase four will be 100 and uh, following that then we don't know but we would hope that it will be more more open following phase four's uh, completion um, I think I've answered a few questions there, uh, Carla. There's probably a few more in the chat. I don't know if you want to... Yeah, um, so I'll pop through a few of these questions mm -hmm. with you now. Um, yeah. I'm just going to have a look to see what else is not answered. Um, so there's a question in, does the COVID officer need to be affiliated to Robinson Ireland? Connor, you might take that. Yep, yeah, they would need to be affiliated. And uh, as well as that, if they are working with juveniles, they'll need to be guard vetted as well. Yeah, and then the next question in is, can we give more information on doubles play? Can this start from the 29th? Uh, yeah, yeah, it absolutely can. Um, again, that wasn't the case a week ago, so it's a welcome uh, improvement. Uh, that being said, um, you know, people do need to still practice caution uh, in this. And Fik, you might correct me if I'm wrong, but in this iteration, we're advising very limited crossover in terms of doubles. Yes. Just to keep your, your partnerships to a limit uh, and uh, maybe play with the same person and the same group uh, as much as possible. Um, just to avoid that, that, that transmission, the longer this goes on, the further down the R number goes, we'll be able to relax these things as we go. But just for this initial phase, uh, that's what we're advising that, yeah, you can play doubles, but you, you want to limit your partnerships and uh, obviously don't, get in the habit of standing right beside your partner on court for extended periods of time. We accept that you will break the two metre, uh, hopefully soon to be one metre rule uh, on court for, for short spaces of time, but don't, don't obviously uh, extend that for longer periods if you can. And there's a few questions in just about the use of shuttles when it comes to doubles. Obviously we talked about using two shuttles in singles. Um, but just clarification on the use of four shuttles when it's in doubles. Uh, again, no, we're, we've we've just issued the guidance that it's it's uh, one shuttle per side. Or alternatively, again, I know some people may not want to use that many shuttles. Just having um, a plastic glove on your on your serving hand might might also solve the problem. Uh, again, we get that it's a bit prescriptive and it can be a bit awkward, but we do see this only being for a limited amount of time. Hopefully, just phase three. Um, but yeah, we're only ish, or we're only suggesting uh, two shuttles per match or gloves per sh per serving hand. Yep. Um, and Connor, this one's for you. Uh, does a parent have to attend if a coach is holding a training session for juveniles? So long as there's um, so long as there's two adults present and that the, the supervisor is vetted as well, um, that's that's within the supervision the supervision policy that we have. So that would remain. Perfect. Um, and then there's another question in just in regards to playing partners. When you say stick to one playing partner, do you mean with one session or for the next month or the foreseeable future? Apologies. Big. Yeah, no, uh, that's for, for the entirety of phase three. So um, that's the same partner. Um, it, for example, if, if I was playing men's doubles and mixed doubles, I'd have the same men's doubles partner. Uh, for the three weeks and uh, I'd also have then the same mixed doubles partner for the three weeks. Perfect. Thanks, Vic. And then just about hand sanitization. If we sanitize our hands just before we go on court, is that okay instead of using gloves? 
Um, theoretically, you would think yes, but uh, the guidance we were given was that, you know, you don't know if somebody has it. And obviously, we would hope that the, the, the guidelines that are in place and that people's own personal responsibility, and it does come back to that, people's own personal responsibility of, okay, I don't feel too well, I shouldn't go to the club tonight. Um, but we would hope that once people are on court and playing, that none of those people have any are at the lowest chance of having the virus. However, in the off chance that someone is on court and they have the virus, they can sanitize their hands. But after about 10 minutes of play, you know, they'll wipe their face, they'll wipe their nose. That's 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 going to happen. Um, and if they have it, all of a sudden, by touching one shuttle and serving, another person has it. And it's that quick. Um like I said, I would hope that that's a rule we can phase out in the next phase. And we are working towards that, but that's where we are at at the moment. Thanks, David. Um, and then just for yourself, Connor, can a club have two COVID officers? Yeah, there's there's no limit. Um, I suppose the, the term uh, many hands make like work is uh, is the, the key phrase here. We want, we want people who are going to be available to help in their club. So if your club requires three COVID officers, it's just important that they understand what their role is and that they're able to fulfill it to, to the best of their ability. Perfect. Um, and then just one more for yourself, Connor, is how does COVID records comply with data protection? I know that you have touched on it, but just in case anybody joined us late. Yep, it's just a case really of uh, making sure that it's just the name and, and uh, mobile phone, phone number that you're taking for uh, either the for the player or for the player's parents if it's a juvenile and again it's it's a case of uh, just being uh, being careful with with the data um, and making sure obviously number one that your contact details are are correct that's mm. that's the most important thing to take out of this as well Th theoretically as well it is um provided the membership system is up to date and we do advise all individual members to make sure the club has their up-to-date information but provided that the, the membership system is up to date and anyone playing is registered with that club, the club simply just needs to record the names. And if the COVID officer is given access to, to which we would do, give the COVID officers access to view the data, uh, they can simply take the names and check the contact information against the club, which would completely rule out any need to, to safeguard that piece of paper. Then just a question in about um, people who are deemed to be high risk. Is there a blanket ban on people in high risk from playing in this phase in singles or doubles? Or is this ultimately up to your GP? Is there any indication on updates for the next phase on this? Um, I, I'll, I'll talk about that. Uh, there, there's no blanket ban on people um, who are deemed in the high risk. We even saw that in tennis in early phases that they were 70 year old, 70 plus year olds were allowed to play. Um, we, the advice is that it's personal responsibility. The, the individual who is deemed at high risk has to take some level of responsibility here. It, it's their decision to go out in public. It's their decision if they want to play in a club. And uh, our advice to them is you should really, the clubs should be insistent that they get uh, advice from their GP. And pers from a personal standpoint, they should want to get that advice themselves as well. Um, so no, there's no blanket ban. Um, it's really just the person needs to take some personal responsibility and make sure that they're comfortable going out uh, into, into the public, into a, a risk category. And Connor's developing um, uh, or may have already developed disclaimer forms so that people are aware of the risks when they join a club. Um, but for people at high risk, they obviously need to have a more heightened uh, awareness. On the updates for the next phase, no, not yet. And to, to be perfectly honest with people, I don't see it going away until there's a vaccine. I do think that there's going to always be a uh, insistence that especially people in the more at risk uh, parts of community, the people who are deemed high risk to always have that air of caution. Um, there is still obviously a fear of a potential second wave um, and people who are at the high risk would be the most vulnerable from that. Um, Connor, just one more question for you that's in. How long do the clubs keep the records of those playing? You're on mute there, Connor. All right, yeah. There, you go. <laughs> um, there I am. I, I was bound to have a technical glitch at one stage. Um, yeah, um, in terms of holding on to the records, uh, at present, like I said, if it's just the name and the telephone number, 
you can hold on to that for uh, until I suppose we, we ease out of these restrictions as such uh, until we get to some sense of normality. Um, if if it's if it is a case that um, obviously that uh, we get a GDPR um, uh, tool in, um, obviously that will take off some some of the pressure in terms of holding that. Um, but yeah, yeah for, again, for uh, time, on that. Uh, we, yeah. we are aware that this contact tracing piece will be particularly difficult for clubs, and we're we're very keen to get some kind of technical solution or some kind of a solution in. Um, that uh, can help solve uh, that problem for clubs. Um, but like I said before, obviously all the data is held in our membership system up until the rest of the year and beyond that. So, you know, a workaround for that is making sure everyone's affiliated and using uh, their BI numbers or just their, their first names uh, and just keeping those, you know, there, there's no GDPR risk. Uh, I suppose if it's a question of, you know, how long do we need to hang on to it in case there's a case, uh, you'd probably need to hang on to it for at least a month from that session, uh, I would advise, um, Connor, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, I know there's a two week incubation period. So, I mean, a month is probably a safe, a safe yeah. one. Yeah. I, I don't think there'll be a whole pile of information that you'll have to be holding on to anyway. Mm -hmm. in, in any case, it's, it's merely a case of utilizing what resources we'll have available for clubs. And then just next question is, do you think that the first Irish international event will take place, which is scheduled for the end of August, i.e. the Irish Under-19 Open? Yeah, um, obviously uh, the larger events, not just our own internationals, but the, the the branch events as well are the ones that are happening towards the end of August and September. Those are under, under uh, review at the moment. Uh, nothing has been cancelled for the start of the season. Um, information is coming out daily uh, we're still waiting to see this green list of countries that, that are allowed to travel in that might impact the internationals um but obviously we're taking a cautious approach to this and we are we are at the moment it is still down to be played um and we're reviewing things at the moment there's a lot of uh moving parts to this and things change depending on the advice um but if we make a decision to cancel it it'll be it'll be notified on the, the website straight away Perfect. And then just in relation to one-on-one -on -one training, can you do one-on-one -on -one training with a private trainer in a centre regarding a juvenile being privately trained? So um, yeah, well, that would be a, that would be a private arrangement between a private trainer and, uh, and a parent. So that's kind of outside of our remit to a certain degree. Um, but obviously within a club, we always advise in terms of supervision that a coach, a coach and and, in, and basically, in terms of all safeguarding principles, you're looking at um, the adult being safe as well as the child. So we would always advise that an adult is never left alone with the child. Perfect. And then just in relation to uh, juveniles again, Connor, the last one in at the moment, uh, is there a form of induction for the juveniles that can be used and where would somebody get it? Yeah, uh, well, currently we're working on the COVID officer training, but we are hoping to have uh, some form of uh, an induction training available for clubs as well further down the line. But then as soon as we have that available, we'll be, we'll be in communication with clubs. Perfect. Wait one second, I just go through these. Um, and then just in about insurance, um, what is the insurance situation if a if a club unfortunately has an outbreak? Um, yeah, so the insurance company have been pretty clear with us. As long as a club um, can demonstrate uh, that they have been following the guidelines and the safety protocols. And what that means is, you know, doing a risk assessment, obviously making sure that it, the, the risk assessment wasn't a tick box exercise and you go back to normal the second, uh, the second you get into the club. Having a COVID officer, uh, all of those, as long as you can demonstrate that those are being done, um, your insurance will not be impacted at all. Um, the uh, If there is an outbreak, obviously there's the potential that the club might have to, to close its doors for a couple of weeks, but um, the club will be covered. Uh, and they, will not, uh, they will not lose their insurance uh, should they have an outbreak, um, but they would be more liable if it was proven that they hadn't followed or they were negligent. Thanks, David. Um, and then just in relation to COVID officers again, um, just it can be difficult to get a COVID officer to attend all sessions. 
in the case of an adult club, can those concerned be briefed and made personally responsible for abiding guidelines? Connor. Is that for me, is it? Yeah. <laughs> um, in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the COVID officer, I suppose the fact that we haven't limited it to just one person, I think if, if, it's, if it is uh, put to the club in order for it to operate safely and in line with the Badminton Ireland guidelines, um, I, I think you'll, you'll find that you will get people that will be willing to lend a hand and assist the club in getting up and running, um, given the current situation. And to be honest, the role itself, it's not all on the COVID officer. It's a case of people being personally responsible, as, as you've highlighted. And uh, in terms of doing that, you're going to lessen the, the load on the COVID officer. So um, I, I, I would say that it's a case of seeking out those who may be able to, to help you out within your club and um, depending on your numbers, obviously, and, and seeing if, if there is a possibility of a rota being done up within your club as a solution to, to that particular problem. Perfect. And then just the final question and at the moment is, when can we accept, expect to see next season's provisional calendar on the BI site? Uh, I would say next week, uh, the events committee have met, they've approved the provisional calendar. As I said um, earlier on, the only sort of uh, question mark is fitting in some of the events from some of the uh, the events and uh, tournaments and stuff from last season. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll put a provisional calendar in next week anyway. Uh, so, so keep an eye out for that. Perfect. Um, that looks to be all the questions for the moment. There's nothing else in. I see one in there from Sarah. Is there a risk assessment form on the website, Connor? Yeah, the uh, the template is on the website. It's available to download in Word format, and also the, um, the there's a, a template for a coach risk assessment as well up there now as well. Is there any more questions there, Carla? Uh, just the final one at the moment is, can a non-BI member refuse to complete the disclaimer form? Again, as I said at the outset, we have no control over non-members. So, I mean, yeah, theoretically they can. Uh, again, that's my advice to, to club secretaries right now. This is, this is really obviously a good example of why everyone should be affiliated uh, because they will have to adhere to our rules and they'll be covered and people might not be aware but there is a directors and officers uh, liability insurance as part of club insurance but that only applies to members of bi if somebody has a dispute with the club uh, for playing on a uh, it, maybe in a, a playing night and they, they think they've contracted covid but they weren't a member we we won't get involved in that particular case because we can't because it was a non-member uh, so my advice is is clear on that i i would strongly urge people to make sure it's just affiliated members playing in your club perfect and then what is the likelihood of juvenile leagues going ahead next season i mean by all indication everything is going in the right direction we would expect the season in september to hopefully be back to almost normality there might still be some restrictions in place we would probably have to maintain the contact tracing piece uh there may be some uh hopefully reduced um, social distancing requirements but so far we see everything going well the only thing that will upset this uh, process is if there's an outbreak if there's an outbreak in badminton in the badminton community that's going to cause us problems just from our badminton point of view obviously if there's a resurgence in general we may see a rolling back um, and some more restrictions being brought in you can't predict for that um, it's happening in some other countries which is um, worrying to see but uh, we are, we really are just waiting. Um, we can only really operate on the information we have from the government right now um, and what they've laid out. And so far, uh, things have been go moving in a good direction and we are have not cancelled or postponed anything for next season. Okay. I think that's it, is it? Yeah, that's it. Okay, so I mean, look, just to finish up, thank you everybody for your attention this evening. Um, I appreciate that this is new territory for everybody and uh, some of the restrictions are going to make life difficult for people coming back. Uh, we're working hard to provide as much resources and support as we can. Uh, I would advise everybody to check the website or the COVID-19 page regularly. We're going to be putting up more stuff. We're going to look at more uh, maybe in-depth webinars uh, in the next couple of weeks. Connor is looking to put together perhaps uh, something 
something uh, that might help people once we start to see some of the practical challenges once you actually get back to playing so identifying those and coming up with solutions for that um we will keep communicating and we will definitely have another one of these sessions if not more than one prior to the start of the season uh hopefully with uh better uh protocols that are uh, less restrictive on play um but if there's no more questions um then i want to thank everybody for their time and uh i think that's it there's no definitely no more questions We're happy enough okay Great. Um, all right, guys. Well, look, thank you very much for your time tonight. And uh, we will have this. Am I right in saying this will be up live if people want to come back and clarify anything? Yeah. So this uh, webinar is streaming live on our YouTube page. So if you go onto YouTube and then just type in Badminton Ireland um, and open our page, you'll be able to play it back whenever Perfect. you want to watch it again. Perfect. And again, look, uh, if you have any uh, more in-depth concerns, feel free to contact the office. You have the guy's email address. All the details are up on the website. Okay. Thanks, everyone.